Welcome back. We're going to continue talking about gases and we're going to be talking about the ideal gas law and Dalton's law of partial pressure. In your textbook it's page 139 to 150 and by the end of this lecture you'll be able to perform calculations involving the ideal gas law, describe and explain the behavior of gases under extreme conditions, describe Dar Dalton's law of partial pressure, perform calculations involving Dalton's law of partial pressures, and that's about it. So, before we do that, we're actually going to do a quick review of kinetic, kinetic molecular theory. Uh, kinetic molecular theory explains why gases are compressible while solids and, solids and liquids are not. And this is because uh, the volume of a gas is mostly empty space, so the molecules can get closer together. It explains uh, that pressure is a result of gas particles colliding with each other and with the uh, and with other objects, uh, such as the edges of a container or a balloon. It explains Boyle's law, the idea that volume and pressure are inversely proportional, or as the volume is reduced, molecules have shorter distances before they can collide with their container, so the pressure is going to increase. So as the volume decreases, pressure increases. And it explains Charles' law, uh, that volume and temperature are directly proportional, or that as one of them increases, the other increases as well. If we increase the temperature, we're causing the gas molecules to move faster. If they're moving faster, they're going to be pushing on their container more, and they're going to be pushing on that container, causing it to expand. So we're just going to go through and we're going to look to see if we can identify the false statements regarding kinetic molecular gas theory. Uh, the first one is that molecules have no volume. This is true. And this is the idea of a point mass for an ideal gas. Molecules move with rapid random motion again. This is true. It explains actually that motion is related to temperature. The motion of a molecule is linear, that's true. Molecules are attracted to each other by intermolecular forces. Gases are not attracted to each other by intermolecular, intermolecular forces. They're moving too fast and they're too small. So they rarely contact each other and when they do, they only engage in elastic collisions. In other words, they bounce off each other like ping pong balls. The kinetic energy of a molecule is directly proportional to the Celsius temperature of a molecule. That is also false. It's the Kelvin temperature that it's directly proportional to. So now we're going to get to the idea of, or the formation of the ideal gas law. So ideal gases, as we discussed, are hypothetical. Um, it's a gas that would never condense when it's cooled, and it would be composed of particles with no size. So they would have mass, but no volume. And so, of course, real objects can't exist that way, but gases, even real gases, get very close to approximating this condition. And if we take a look on an example of molar volume, for an ideal gas, the molar volume is 22.4 liters per mole. That's the amount of space that one mole of a, an ideal gas would take up. When they're actually calculated, when they actually find out how much space some gases take up at STP, uh, here's just a few select ones, helium and uh, oxygen and chlorine gas, they're very, very close to that 22.4. And it turns out that the smaller the gas particles are, the closer to 22.4 the molar volume actually gets. So real gases behave very, very closely to an ideal gas behavior, so we assume they're ideal gases. And that's the way we're going to treat them in this course. So the ideal gas law combines a bunch of stuff we talked about. It combines the idea of Boyle's law, Charles's law, and Avogadro's theory in terms of the number of molecules being related to the volume into the ideal gas law. PV is equal to NRT. I remem remember it by saying Pivnert. And there's a list of 
the variables. P is still pressure, V is still volume, T is the temperature in Kelvin, of course, and R is a constant. Um, it's in your data booklet on page 3. The one that you'll need to know is just the top one. It's the 8.31 in your data booklet on page 3. It's actually 8.314, so that's the value we should use. 8.314, and the units there, um, kilopascals times liters over moles times times Kelvin, uh, those just help cancel everything out. So it's a constant, kind of a correction value that's used to get the right answer. So the units are there just to make sure they cancel out the rest of the units in the equation to get the units you want. And of course N is the number of moles of whatever we're measuring, so there we go. Most of the time, we're not going to know the number of moles, we're going to be given a mass. And so we're going to be combining this formula with our molar mass formula. And if we just isolate our n, n is equal to mass over molar mass, and so often what we'll do is we'll take this molar mass formula and just substitute our mass over molar mass for the number of moles. So mass over molar mass, RT. Um, you can't really call it Pivnert anymore because you got a couple of m's in there, but it's the same thing. So here we're going to determine the mass of a sample of argon gas in a 0.88 liter glass tube if the pressure inside the tube is 0.98 atmospheres. And we've just recopied down that the R value for atmospheres, and there's our temperature. So you know when to use the ideal gas formula when you're only given one set of conditions. In other words, there's not two volumes and two pressures and two temperatures. If you have two of each, or if you're looking almost two of each, then you're probably going to use the combined gas law. When you're only given one set of conditions, you're going to end up using uh, the ideal gas law. So there's only one set of conditions. And so we're going to use, we got we need a pressure, a volume, an N, an R, and a T. And since we're looking for mass, we don't know how many moles we have. Our volume is 0 0.88 liters. Our pressure, 0 0.98 atmospheres. And so we're going to use our R value. Up here, I'm not going to bother rewriting it down, but we definitely know it. And the temperature is 23 degrees Celsius, which is, we're going to add to it the 273.15, and so we'll get 296.15 kelvins. And so the version of the formula I'm going to use is PV is equal to mass over molar mass times RT, and now I'm going to isolate mass. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by RT, on this side they cancel out. So PV over RT is equal to mass over molar mass. And now I can multiply both sides by molar mass. When I do that, the molar mass is cancel on the right hand side, and so the mass of argon is equal to the molar mass times the pressure times the volume over our constant R times the temperature. And then it's just a matter of plugging in the values. For argon gas, the molar mass is 39.95, 39.95 grams per mole. And here's, for this formula, I usually skip writing down the units only because you run out of space, so 0.98 the volume is 0 0.88 liters. R, since we're in atmospheres, is 0 0.0821. And our temperature is 296.15 kelvins. We run that through our calculator, and we get 1. 
and since we only actually have two sig digs, 1.4 grams. So that's the mass of argon gas inside of our 0.88 liter tube at a given pressure and temperature. So the biggest trick with using this um, ideal gas law is just making sure you do your algebra right when you're manipulating your formula. So here's another one. Determine the volume of a gas of hydrogen gas if we have 22.3 millimoles of hydrogen gas at SATP. So again we only have one set of conditions so we're going to use PV is equal to NRT and we have pressure, we have the number of moles, we always have R, and we have temperature, so we're looking for volume. So in order to find our volume, we're going to divide both sides by pressure. On the left side, pressures cancel, and so the volume of our H2 gas is equal to NRT over P. Number of moles is 0 decimal 0, 223 moles. I just divided it by a thousand so that I'm actually in moles. Our R is 8.314. Our temperature, that's right, SATP is going to be the 273.15 plus 25 degrees Celsius. And so it's 2. 98.15 and our pressure at STP is 100 kilopascals. We run that through our calculator and we end up with 0 decimal 553 and it's going to be liters and so We'll just make sure we allowed three sig digs, and it, so it would be 553 milliliters would probably be the best way to express it. Another example, we want to find the molar mass of a gas if it occupies, if 0.79 grams occupy 275 mils, 37 degrees, and 745 torr. So, we need molar mass, so this means we're, we're going to use PV is equal to mass over molar mass times RT to isolate molar mass. Uh, the easiest way to do it, again, I don't want to get my formula wrong. Anytime I'm looking for a variable that's in the in the denominator, I'm going to multiply both sides by my denominator just so that it's no longer in a denominator. So on this side they'll cancel and we get MPV is equal to little m RT and then we're going to isolate the big M by dividing both sides by P and V. And so molar mass is equal to mass times RT over the pressure times the volume. So there's our formula for finding molar mass, we have a mass. We always have R. Now R, we only have R for atmospheres and KPAs. They're giving us a pressure in torr, which means we're going to have to convert to one of the two. I'll convert to atmospheres just because, or I'll convert to, sorry, kilopascals just because those are standard units. Um, we have a temperature. We've got to convert it to Kelvin. We have and we have a pressure. Since we're converting our R, we're going to have to convert our pressure as well. Or we're actually converting our pressure so we can use the right R. And we have a volume as well in milliliters. So we do have stuff, we just got to convert our pressure into kilopascals. So we know that 745 torr, and we're looking for X kilopascals. Our conversion factor is going to be 101.325 kilopascals is equal to 760 torr. Again, not something you have to memorize. It'll be given on any test. And so when we multiply through, we get 
99.3 we'll go 33 just to carry an extra digit along kilopascal so there we have our pressure now we can finish our calculation so the molar mass of our unknown is equal to 0 0.79 grams the R we're going to use is 8.314 since we converted to kilopascals our temperature is 37 plus our 273.15 so 310.15 and we're going to divide by our pressure of 99.33 kilopascals and our volume of 0 0.2 seven five liters. Um, we're always going to convert to one set of units. We're always going to have liters because this constant that we're using uses units of liters and kilopascals. So we're always going to make sure that our our numbers are in um, grams, liters, kilopascals, and kelvins. So you want to make sure that all of your numbers are in their base units. Otherwise your units won't cancel out properly. So we're going to run this through our calculator and get an answer. And we get an answer of 74.58 grams per mole. We're only allowed two significant digits, so our molar mass is going to be 75 grams per mole. So I have no idea what gas this is, but whatever gas it is, it has a molar mass of 75, 75 grams per mole. Okay, calculate the density of chlorine gas at STP. And so, just to get a recall, that density is equal to mass over volume. Now if we take a look at our, our ideal gas law, we have a volume. We don't have mass yet, but we know that we can go PV is equal to mass over molar mass times RT. And here we have mass, and here we have volume. So if we can rearrange our formula so that mass and volume are on one side, that mass divided by volume is density. And since we have STP, we have pressure, we have a temperature, we always have R, and we have a molar mass for chlorine gas. So we have everything we need. All we got to do is rearrange our formula so that we have the right variables in the right spot. So I'm going to end up putting my mass and molar mass, or my mass and volume on one side. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this thing without the circles and check marks. And the first thing I'm going to do is just multiply both sides by molar mass just to clear up my denominator. And so I'm going to have MPV is equal to little m RT. And now I want my volume on one side and my RT on the other. So I'm going to divide both sides by RT. And I'm going to divide both sides by volume. And so when I do that, volumes cancel on this side. RTs cancel on this side. And so what I'm left with is mass times pressure over R times temperature is equal to mass over volume which is the same thing as density. So the density of chlorine gas at STP is going to be the molar mass. And remember, chlorine gas is diatomic, so the molar mass is going to be, I've got to get my periodic table out here, 35.45 times 2, so 70.9 grams per mole. The pressure at STP is 101.325 kilopascals. R is 8.314. I'm not going to bother writing down the units because it takes too long. I usually have them upside down anyways. Our temperature is 273.15 kelvins. 
once we run it through our calculator, we get an answer of 3.16, and it's going to be grams per liter. And I know it's per liter because my R value is always in liters when we talk about volume. So we know it's going to be grams per liter. And when I check the sig digs, um, I guess our least accurate would be our molar mass, which is actually 70.90. So we better put in all four sig digs, 3.163 grams per liter. Since our smallest value has four sig digs, both our constant and our molar mass have four sig digs. So um, we can use our, our ideal gas law as long as we're under fairly normal conditions. As soon as we start to get away from normal conditions, room temperature, um, or STP, SATP, uh, if we're within 100 degrees of that, that's not too bad. Uh, and as long as our pressures are fairly normal as well. Under high pressures, uh, gases actually end up getting close enough together that they interact with one another. And they can interact with the walls of their container. So, the interactions reduce the force of the collisions with the walls, which means the pressure is actually going to be almost lower than we would expect as we increase pressure. So the pressure is still going to be high, but it's not going to increase as rapidly because as those molecules get closer together, their intermolecular forces start allowing them to become attracted to each other and hit the wall with less force. So under high pressures, the pressure actually increases slower than we would expect. And this is why gases condense, is because as those molecules get close enough together, they actually start sucking up to each other and forming a liquid. Uh, so as we increase the pressure again, at standard pressure, gas molecules are so far apart, they take up a very small percentage of the container. As we increase the pressure, they actually take up a they actually take up a significant percentage of the container. So that's gases under uh, non-ideal conditions. One last topic would be Dalton's law of partial pressure. So, uh, with the kinetic theory of gases, um, all gases are considered to be the same size. They're point masses. Technically, they have no volume and they have no as opposed to mo attractive forces so they have no attractive forces uh, and they move quickly through empty space since all gases are the same regardless of what they're composed of the pressure exerted by each particle is the same as every other particle in the mixture so what this means is each gas in a mixture has a partial pressure equal to the percentage of the mixture it makes up. So, if you make up here we have an example where we have two gases that are separated. One pressure, or in the container with fewer molecules, the pressure is 0.5 atmospheres. In the container with more molecules, the pressure is one atmosphere. When you mix the two together, you simply add the two pressures so that the gas from container A adds its 0.5 atmospheres of pressure to the pressure in container B which is one atmospheric pressure. So the total number of moles you would just add, you have 0.3 moles of one gas plus 0.6 moles of another gas, you have a total of 0.9 moles of gas. You do the same thing with the pressures. You simply add the pressures together because each of those gases acts independently against the container. And it doesn't matter the composition of either gas. So the total pressure is summed, and this is because the molecules are going to collide with the size of the container just as frequently as they did before. So we can consider them uh, independently. So here, here we have an example of dry air is 78% oxygen, oh sorry, 78% nitrogen. 20.95% oxygen and almost 1% argon gas. 
if the pressure exerted by an air sample is 92.3 kilopascals, then we're going to determine the partial pressure of each gas. And this is fairly simple. Each gas, or we can say this, we can say nitrogen gas is 78.08% of the mixture. So, it's responsible for 78.08% of the pressure. So we simply take our atmospheric pressure, so the pressure of nitrogen gas is equal to Uh, where we go, 92.3 kilopascals times 78.08%, which really is 0 0.7808 when we do our multiplication. The pressure of oxygen gas is the same, same idea. It's 92.3 kilopascals times its proportion of the mixture, 0. 2095 and we can do the same thing with the pressure for argon gas. It's going to be the 92.3 kilopascals times 0. Point, and here we just make sure we get our number right 0093 and we get three answers here. So the first one 92.3 times 0 0.7808. So the pressure exerted by nitrogen would be 72, and we have three sig digs, so 72.1 kilopascals. The pressure exerted by oxygen would be 19.3 kilopascals and the pressure exerted by our argon gas would be 0 0.858 kilopascals. So that's the pressure exerted by each gas. Is uh, vapor pressure and vapor pressure is how when water evaporates it goes from the liquid phase into a gas phase so at the surface of any body of water uh, the water molecules some of them gain just enough energy to become gaseous and they evaporate into the air uh, these gas particles exert pressure and the warmer the water is or the warmer the surroundings are the more water molecules can enter that gaseous state and the partial pressure of H2O is increased Often, when we collect a gas, they're collected in over, or they're collected in an inverted tube. So, what we do is, if we want to collect a gas, if we're doing a chemical reaction that we know is going to produce a gas, we often do it in solution, and we put a test tube in water, and the test tube is filled with water as well. The chemical reaction is going to take place down here. As it produces a gas, it makes bubbles and the bubbles displace the water. So as the bubbles rise up, water comes down and out, and we end up collecting a gas in the top of our test tube. Now in that test tube, or then that gas mixture, there's also going to be water vapor, and that water vapor is going to exert a pressure, and it's going to interfere with our, our calculations if we don't account for that pressure exerted by water. Okay, so we have one final example here. Here we have a reaction with zinc and hydrochloric acid producing hydrogen gas. And it's found that 35 milliliters of gas are collected over uh, water at 25 degrees Celsius. And there's the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees Celsius just grabbed off our table in the previous slide. 
and the pressure was 745 torr. We want to determine the partial pressure of the hydrogen gas in the collection tube and the mass of hydrogen glass gas collected. So we have two sets of calculations. The first one is fairly straightforward. We know that based on Dalton's law, the total pressure inside that container is equal to the pressure of the hydrogen gas plus the pressure of water or the partial pressure of each of those things um, inside our collection tube. Uh, the only hitch is, so the pressure, and so we'll just rearrange this formula, the pressure of hydrogen gas is going to be equal to the total pressure minus the pressure of or exerted by our water vapor. The only hitch is that we're in two different sets of units. So we're going to convert one to the other. We're going to convert everything into kilopascals just because those are the, those are the standard units. Uh, the total pressure was 745 torr. And we're going to multiply that by our 101.325 kilopascals and then divide it by our 760. So since 760 torr is the same as 101.325 kilopascals, we can multiply by one and divide by the other. Torr's cancel and we're left with 99.33 kilopascals. So that is the sorry we want from that we want to subtract the 3.173 kilopascals from the pressure of water. And we end up with 96.15 kilopascals. And we're only allowed three significant digits, so our answer is going to be 96.2 kilopascals. So there's the partial pressure of hydrogen gas. And now we can find out the mass of hydrogen gas in our collection tube using our PV is equal to NRT. And since we want mass, we're going to use PV is equal to mass over molar mass times RT. And when we isolate, we're going to get molar mass times pressure times volume over RT, and that's what will give us our mass of hydrogen gas, H2. So the mass of H2, the molar mass of H2 is 2.02 .02 grams per mole. Pressure is the partial pressure of hydrogen gas. We're going to use the answer from our last calculation, the 96.2 kilopascals. The volume is 35 milliliters, or 0 0.035 liters. And we have to put it in liters because our R value is in liters, so 8.314. Since that has units of liters, we've got to keep our volume in liters. And our temperature is the 25 plus 273.15. So that's 298.15. 298.15 Kelvins. We run it through our calculator and we should get the mass of hydrogen. So the mass of hydrogen is small, which makes sense because we only have 35 milliliters of the gas. 0 0.00274 grams, which would be the same as 2.74 milligrams. The other way you could do it is 2.74 times 10 to negative 3 grams. Either answer is good. Uh, it's nice to use the milligrams when you can. It just looks neater than the scientific notation. So here's the homework. 
Uh, lots of practice problems for Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. Oh, sorry here. Practice problems for the end of Chapter 4. There's also some review questions that are Chapter 3 and 4. The solutions are in uh, Appendix B. And once you get through those, be sure to check your answers. If you have any questions, please contact me or a TA. And there is one test that covers the material in both chapters.